Yeah, Frank, you know, on, on NPR this morning, they had Frank Oz. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually my, my thing about cryptozoology. I used to work with puppets. I worked on dinosaurs, a Muppet Christmas Carol, and Tesla Street Live, and the others. And so as I always explain to people, I'm not a professional creature scientist, but I am a professional creature builder. And uh -huh. so I approach it from that angle of that. I know how you can fake the evidence. I know very well. <laughs> Yes, are now. Possibly be fake. Oh, it is, and I'll tell you why. Bill and I were talking. It's like I can give you about three million reasons why I think that thing is fake. Oh, we'll talk about it. Welcome to Lee Henry Library's PopCon 2022. This is our panel on cryptozoology. We have Bill Mulligan, longtime local teacher at UC here. He also is a fan aficionado and has been in several films. And this is Cheryl Lambert. She has worked with the Jim Henson Company and loves to create puppets and has written this book right here. You can buy it on Amazon. And she's also a cryptozoologist um, herself and has, we're going to talk about that today. So take it away. Thanks for coming. Um, yes, so like you said, I teach at the high school, I do podcasts, I've been involved in filmmaking and stuff, and all of that pales in significance of all the stuff that Cheryl has done. She is just, you know, listen to your friends, don't be lost. Don't be lost. Well, as we said, I used to work for Muppets years ago, uh, Christmas Mother, Christmas Carol, one of my favorite projects. I do costumes and props for film and TV. I've worked on uh, films such as Patriot, Leatherheads, Hunger Games, and then all 90 few others. TV shows such as Homeland and Outcast. Uh, I am currently in the running, waiting to hear if I've gotten the Guinness World Record for the largest number of finger puppets. So um, I hope you hear about that soon. I have several books uh, in the works. In fact, I have a book. I have that book. I've got a book about introduction to puppetry arts. I have a book called Haunted Theaters of the Carolinas. I'm a ghost hunter going along with my cryptozoology. And this fall, I have a new book coming out called Art in the Time of Corona, where during the pandemic beginning, we see into the town and say, take a thing this art will be recreated. Well, I did that and took a million steps further. And I have a whole book coming out this fall showing the different art works. It's, it's really cool. She did a panel of only conventions and showed where she took these famous works of art and, you know, with a low budget. Very low budget. It's That's just me and my phone, yes. <laughs> and uh, I've done uh, The Last Supper, The Whole Last Supper. Um, I think my favorite is still Washington Cross in Delaware. So, uh, all the characters. And the book. Yes. <laughs> what got you into Christmas as well? What was the, what was the creature? Yeah. You know, growing up, and that was everybody. I love a good campfire story about Bigfoot, of course, a lot less monster. And uh, as I'm studying, you know, the ghosts that I do my paranormal research, you stumble across their ghosts because that's part of paranormal. And I've always been fascinated by that. And I'm like you, I want to believe. And I used to believe wholeheartedly. I used to be, oh yeah, Bigfoot is real, this monster is real, all these guys are real. The more research I do, and even the further I get in my technical film career, the less convinced I am. And don't get me wrong, I want them to be out there, but I have yet to see a photograph, a foot cast, a video that I or my film colleagues could not have done as well or better. <laughs> so it's it's a little hard for me to, to look at these now and think, oh yeah, it's really out there, and I want him to be, but it's, I, as I was telling Bill, I think a lot of the cryptids we have are normal creatures in abnormal circumstances. And so, but the research is fine. The myths and legends are fine. And it's interesting to know that every culture has some kind of Bigfoot. Yeah. Every culture has some kind of lake monster. So, you know, that's certainly an interesting um, take on or, or an idea about us as people as a whole, different cultures. Yeah, why did, why did everybody come up with the idea of dragons? And my argument, maybe it was we found fossils of creatures. You know, a cave bear, a, a skull of a cave bear looks like a dragon. You know, maybe it was that it? Is this a memory of something that goes back? And it, it could be. And I mean, maybe, maybe it was real. You know, they, they, they were, there's an island where they had legends of little people. And they recently found a offshoot of the human race that they, they called the hobbits. But they were about eight tall, and they survived, we think, up to maybe 5,000 years ago. Yeah. There's also a species of miniature mountain 
the last ones left on Earth. And a volcano apparently wiped them out. Okay, that's kind of interesting. How long maybe did they last beyond that? That this, these tails became integrated into the native myth. Exactly, and there's, it's interesting to know there have been recent sightings in Charlotte of pterosaurs. Yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, so, we'll talk about that. So at, at her suggestion, because we cryptozoology can talk for hours. Oh, yeah. So we said, what about North Carolina? Oh, yes. And she sent me a list. I, I did a little research on my own. First of all, I said, the top ten monsters of North Carolina, three of them were big. I don't know why they just gave me a big one. It's like, well, now, number seven, Nobby. It's like it's Bigfoot. Uh, yeah. Okay, we already had yeah. 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 Some of them are cool. And guess what? Look, North Carolina, this is God's country. I mean, we've got beautiful. If, if you're going to be a monster, you could do way worse than North Carolina. We've got these gorgeous mountains. Has every inch of them been, been stepped on by a human? I don't know. Maybe not. It's a big place. You know, I always think, big, come on, give me a break. The most technologically advanced country on Earth, 320 million people, and there's a giant, a family of giant gorillas. Thousands of them running around. That's impossible. And then you get in an airplane and you fly over the country and you realize it's mostly trees. But yeah, yeah, you can hide here. You know? You I never people. found D.B. Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> people often comment, well, if they out there, why haven't we stumbled across a corpse or a body or something? Well, I mean, I go hiking quite a bit. I haven't stumbled across a deer or a bear corpse with those either. Yeah. And I think a large part of it is your nature works pretty quickly. Something dies and it's gone almost immediately. And if there's any animal that might actually bury its dead, it would be big. Exactly. We have swamps. I mean, they're scary. You don't need a monster to scare the swamp. You know, every step you take could be a snapping turtle or a water moccasin. We've got more beach than any other place in the country. So we've got the Barrier Islands and everything, so that's two more beaches. Sea monsters. We have abandoned houses. We have abandoned villages. If you go traipsing through the woods, it's no surprise if you find an old road, and it doesn't look like a road anymore, it just looks like younger trees in a straight line, and there's houses. And they were built well back in those days, so they're still there. They're not looking crisp, but they're still there. And all kinds of stuff. Sometimes there's people living in those. I wouldn't know in those houses if I were you. I did once. I climbed up a rickety staircase and a turkey vulture. I flew in my face, and I came this close to die from a heart attack. Oh, yeah. So we'll start with uh, our own version of the Loch Ness Monster, Normie, the monster of Lake Norman. What would you like to say about Normie? So Normie is the Lake Norman monster. Lake Norman is located right outside of Charlotte. The interesting thing about Lake Norman is it's a man-made lake. It is the cooling facility for the big nuclear plant that's there. And so you think, okay, how can a man-made lake have a lake monster in it? Well, there's some speculation that there's a pretty big catfish in that lake. But again, you're close to the nuclear facility, you're like, hmm, what is actually going on? But there have been reports of large creatures swimming in the lake. Are they catfish? Are they alligators? There was once a giant snake, I think it was an anaconda or a book I can't remember, that had been found at Lake Norman. Apparently some of his pet had been flushed out or had gone away. So there are some large natural creatures there. But there is a whole website dedicated to him, like WomanMonster.com, if you're interested. And uh, who knows? It is a very deep lake. So and, and, and that is common in a lot of the lake monsters, these are deep lakes. Now, this is also a pretty big lake. Yes. It's uh, and, and it was, as she said, it was man-made. They, they dammed up some rivers and flooded the area, which means also Lake Norman has houses and graveyards and things at the bottom if you want to go diving there, if you're out of your mind. I mean, <laughs> have you never watched a horror movie? You're going to go diving <laughs> down the bottom of a lake that has a monster and a graveyard? Pure guess, man. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. If you, if you don't come back, if all that happens, you go diving down there, you take a few pictures, and then the last thing anyone sees is a bunch of bubbles coming up, you can only got yourself to the I know. I wouldn't go down there. And yet, so I found this photograph. Everywhere, if you do a search for Lake Norman Monster, this is the photograph that comes up. I am dubious. That looks like a really big, that has in the markings of an anaconda. I'm guessing this is probably South America or something. There's no reason to believe that's Lake Norman. Um, but here, I did find one interesting theory. They oh, said yes. when, they, when they made the lake, they had to put fish there, just a man-made lake. 
So they decided to hybridize um, the giant Alabama catfish with the giant Missouri carp. I don't know if I got right or whatever. First, I don't know if a carp and a catfish would ever produce five offspring. Seems a little dubious. But they've got that they've got that raven out there that's actually a hybrid raven. So I don't know. And uh, these are all really big fish, and sometimes when you have a hybrid, it actually gets bigger, like a like a lighter lion and tiger with these giant creatures. So they're in a lake that has a nuclear power plant. It keeps it warm. There's lots of food. Like you were saying, the catfish idea, they just sit by the dam, and fish just fall into their mouth, and they get bigger and bigger. They don't exercise much. Because, you know, that's pretty much it. How big can a catfish get? Don't know. I'm not going to go to diving through the dam and find out. But that's our, that's our lake monster. And One of our lake monsters. Yes, a man-made lake. <laughs> well, and who knows, because when they dammed the rivers, what got trapped in there? So, so there would have to be a monster living in the river. There is a Native American legend that there was a, um, a river monster in the Catawba River. And so when it when all of those rivers got dammed up, uh, no, it was maybe something Was this one of those river monsters that would pull you down to the water? Uh, some, yes. Don't they all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I think people, you know, why did why that guy swim across the river and die? Well, he must have been dragged down by the monster. Oh, the monster. Maybe he was swimming across the river, which is never a great idea. The Boojum. All right, so the Boojum is one one of our Bigfoots. Big feet. Bigfoot, yeah, Bigfoots. Um, the Boojum apparently is up in the uh, mountain area and is basically described as a large hairy man. And there have been reports, we've had numerous reports of Bigfoot up in our mountain area. Now, there was a great story, I think this was maybe five or six years ago, about the uh, Bigfoot Boojum that was spotted in Wilkes County. And the uh, homeowner there said he got his get stick and told him to get. <laughs> so that was how he dealt with the Bigfoot. But as uh, Bill was saying, you know, we have our top three cryptids are a Bigfoot, and Bujan is one of them. The thing, one of the unique things about Bujan, to sort of illustrate it here, is that Bujan has a taste for uh, gemstones. So he will often be in the mountains, and we are blessed with wonderful um, gem mining. North Carolina, one of the cool things about it, and he will come along and take your gemstones. <laughs> what he does with them, just collects them like a pack rat. Like a magpie was coming up here, I guess. Which also makes them a great marketing device if you're in the mountains and you want to have the Boojum Gem Festival. Uh, and that, I'm not saying that all cryptos are necessarily marketing hoaxes, but if you've got one, market it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one is, is now like the emblem. He's, he's, the, he's the mascot for the Wombus Cat. Now, the Wombus Cat is actually one of my favorite cryptids because um, I found several interesting things about the Wombus Cat. The original legend is a Cherokee legend about a beautiful um, young uh, Cherokee maiden who wanted to go and see some of the secret uh, uh, ceremonies that the braves would conduct at night. But of course, she was not allowed to. So she defied the law and went and apparently sat in on one of these ceremonies that as a result was cursed to be turned into a cat at times. And so she transforms the beautiful maiden into the Wombus cat. Now that's the legend. There have been quite a few sightings of odd cat-like creatures throughout North Carolina and not just up in the mountains in the Cherokee area. But interestingly enough, a few years ago in New Hooded Marina <laughs> near the, uh, the Tyson plant, there were sightings of an odd creature, and, and when they were doing interviews with the people there at the plant, you saw it. Someone said, I don't know if it was a walrus cat. And I thought it was very interesting that that was the first thing their mind jumped to. But also a few years ago in Greensboro, near Greensboro, in Ashboro, there were sightings of an odd animal that people were speculating, oh, maybe it's a walrus cat. It turned out to be a creature called a Samson fox. A Samson fox is a fox that has a genetic condition that causes it to lose all of its hair. And as we were talking earlier, if you see a, a normal creature without its hair, it looks freaky. Uh, the sloth, for instance. Um, the foxes have an almost deer like. Yes. The, the, they're hiding, they don't, they look, it doesn't look like a fox. Yeah. And it's, so it's interesting to them, but I always thought it was interesting that people's minds automatically jumped to the lumpus cat. And, and cats, the cryptid cats, are very popular all over the world, England especially. People see a cat that's much larger than a house cat, and 
what could it be? Yeah. Not necessarily Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Usually they just say, it's a house cat. And I'm like, I got seven cats, don't you? Um, <laughs> I see cats all the time. I drive, you know, there's feral cats everywhere. None of them make me get out of my car and try to take a picture. So when someone says, you know, I see this giant cat and you come out and take a picture, unfortunately, if your camera isn't really, really top notch, everything you take looks pretty kind of puny. I think we're seeing something, but what exactly we're seeing, I don't know. Yeah. A bobcat? I mean, most of us have never seen a wild bobcat. Not wild. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they might not be in the Yeah, they might not be in the I don't know. Bobcat's well, pretty cool, though. And, uh, and I love cats. Obviously, I love cats. Um, but boy, they are nature's perfect killers. Yeah. So the idea, you know, the thought of a cat that maybe doesn't want to get scratched behind the ears, wants to scratch you behind the ears and you're taking your head off. That's a scary thought because there's not a whole lot you can do about it. By the way, you can see that uh, Sam is a special episode that you've got to get cats. No. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. I have to find out. And I think this is the same animal. I think this is Walter's cat, but he's got a cooler name. This is also a very interesting, interesting quick day. This is basically North Carolina's Chupacabra. Back in the 1960s, uh, in the town of Lane Road, which is a tiny little town right outside of Wilmington, there were reports of livestock and pets getting basically mauled. They were being killed, um, they were you know, lying, by, just lying dead in the fields where they had been attacked by some animal, and apparently an animal with a lot of teeth. And so it came to be known as the Vampire Beast of Lane Border Burrow, because apparently it sucks the blood out too, just like the Chupacabra. Um, there were hunts done for this creature. The sheriff organized a hunt trying to find this. They never found it. And after a short time, it disappeared. There were no further sightings of it, and it has not been seen or heard of since. But it's interesting to note there were a lot of articles about it. As you can see, yeah, vampire turned this woman there. You can see that article. And it was a big deal at the time. And in fact, as you were talking, cashing on your cryptid, Blaker every year does a piece called Boost the Burrow, where they feature the vampire beast. One of the things I like about real life versus movies, I watch a lot of movies. I do podcasts on horror films and everything. In horror movies, no one ever believes that it's a vampire. They'll find a bunch of dead people, two holes in their neck, and they're like, oh, I can't imagine what could have done this. And you're like, is this in a universe where there are no vampire movies? Because in real life, they find a dead animal and it's like, it's been drained of blood. No, it hasn't been drained of blood. It just doesn't keep on bleeding after you've been dead for a while. The blood doesn't have to hold them up by the tail and no blood comes out. Okay, it was drained of blood. But they immediately go for a vampire. It's a vampire beast. Well, they shot this poor bobcat here. Now, I take it back. Bobcats are pretty big, or maybe people are shorter back then, but that's a, that's a major cat. That's, that's kind of, somehow this cat becomes interpreted by artists as this, which then turns into this. And uh, there's the problem. Every t every uh, time you repeat the story, it just gets bigger and with more teeth, and yeah. more blood draining. But that's a great it's a great name, Beast of Blattenberg. That's yeah. Not a beast. Yeah. Very very alliterative. Yes. It just rolls off the top. And yeah, there he is. is. Now, okay. So now he's gotten friendlier. He, he went Disney. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a Blattenberg Beast Fest. Yeah. All the fun. You know, Halloween contest, they probably have dough on a stick and all, you know, just... They cash in on it, Yeah, why not? You know, a little old lady who used to live across the street from me, um, she lived in the same place where Ed Gein lived. You know who Ed Gein was? Okay, I see some people here. Yeah, I won't go into the details. They based Psycho and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre on this guy. And the true story is more horrible than that of those movies. So they... Guys would drive their girlfriends to the house to scare us and cut them off. And then the, the local folks burned it down. They burned it down because they were tired of all these people going there and like, what a lost opportunity. I'd make a museum out of that place. <laughs> Halloween would be cracking. See, some people would give them money and they just throw it. This one I'd never heard of. It yeah, and I'm, I'm actually curious to hear what you found because I, I'm part of them and I did a little research myself. Yeah. There's not a lot out there. So this is one of those stories that takes a lot of twists and turns. The Moon Eyed people are by Cherokee legend. They, the people who were here before the Cherokee. 
And this has been interpreted in all kinds of interesting and sometimes very problematic ways. They, they're called the Moon Eyed People now. You know, this has been interpreted as scary, white eyed, zombie like people. They're called the Moon Eyed People because they, they could not bear the sun. It bothered them too much. They could only come out at night. So they saw that moon, which lead, 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 some people believe they may have been suffering from some form of, uh, what's that, porphyria? Yeah, yeah. You know, that they may have had something that made them sensitive to the sun. Um, their tears, when they were finally eliminated, turned into the crosses that we find around here. This is actually a geological formation. It's, you know, there's nothing super special about that, but that got interpreted into it. There, there's some of the statues that have been found. This is from a museum. This is supposed to be from the United people, which look very alien-like, carved from soapstone. Anything that is ever found that they can't explain is the moon I think. Now, this is the remnants place. Now, this sort of got taken in the 18th century. Folks who started copying down the Cherokee legends, because this stuff wasn't written down. It was all oral tradition. Then the moon Eye people became white-skinned people. And this was incorporated into a legend of Vikings or earlier who came over here and founded stuff. And then it started taking kind of a racist edge to it, where it was like, oh, well, the Cherokee kicked out the first people who were here, and they were white folks, and when the next group of white folks came along, kick out the Cherokee, you should feel so bad about it. Pretty long way to go there. Um, no, I, it, it, it's, it's hard now to actually say what is the actual Cherokee legend and what is the stuff that I've interpreted since then, because whoever wrote this down for the first time put their own flavor in there. And that was the main thing I knew about the Midnight people, was that the, the stone crosses were supposed to be their tears. Yeah. Um, because I, when I looked up in the Asheville area, we would find them every so often on the ground as well. They're very, they're very neat. I'm sure you've all seen them, the little, little stone crosses, and they don't look like anything out of nature, but they are. They're ge geological and uh, are perfectly natural, but it's an interesting legend. See, they just said they carved them like mm -hmm. that. Be fine. So you can say, oh, they're, they're tears. Like, oh, okay, so now it's a, it's a legend. Mm -hmm. I'll take that so far. Yeah. Well, okay, mermaids and sirens, I couldn't really find a whole lot of pictures because. <laughs> yeah, right. But we have a long-standing tradition of mermaids and, and sirens. And I, I guess sirens are basically mermaids that just call you and, and you say, hey, that sounds really grand and you drown. <laughs> so once again, you shouldn't have gone swimming across the river. Yeah. Like on the side. And blame it on the siren. Well, apparently there's supposed to be a siren in the French Broad River. I've been in that one area. Yes, that's yeah, right. There's, yeah, there's the other. And, the French Broad River. French broad. I know. I've always thought the French broad. Yeah, that's what I thought too. It's like, oh, so the siren was the no, I guess it was a white river. Yes. And but she would call you to your death. Like siren. Yeah. If you're like around a body of water and you hear a voice coming from it, what are you remember the Scooby Doo gang? Let's go investigate. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Keep on, just turn around, keep on walking. You've got a good story to tell your kids, which you will live to have if you uh, ignore that. Well, Skunk Ape slash Nobby slash Bigfoot. The same thing, stop with this. Skunk Ape is just Bigfoot who hasn't washed himself. And apparently, one of the distinguishing features of a Bigfoot or a Bigfoot sighting is a terrible smell, which is how the creature being, you know, is a Skunk Ape. Uh, although I think I've heard that one referred to more as the one down in Florida yeah. than, than ours, but apparently all big big big, big boats have a terrible smell. I don't want to get gross, but when do you expect it? Uh, if you're looking in the woods, it'll take a bath. Yeah. 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 And and the skunk ape down the skunk ape down in Florida I actually do believe it because I've seen some photographs, it's pretty obviously either a chip or a orangutan, and there's a lot of crazy folks who try to keep those as pets. Until it either escapes, breaks, you know, or they let it loose, or it tears their face off and makes it, you know, lay out there. They're they're tough animals. They're strong animals, and there's a lot to eat for. You know, you throw you throw just about any animal out down there, and they do fine. Anacondas are taking over, so I don't see why a chick would when they get to they're gonna get big and they're mean and uh, and they grow big. And here's a typical Bigfoot photograph because as soon as Bigfoot shows up. Everyone's ability to focus flies out the window. The best explanation I've heard, and this actually makes perfect sense, is that uh, all photographs of Bigfoot are blurry because Bigfoot is blurry. 
What an amazing adaptation. <laughs> you know? Well, there is one theory that's out there in the cryptozoological community that big, the Bigfoots are actually uh, interdimensional creatures. That they, the reason we don't find bodies, the reason you only see them blurry, the reason you don't see them very often is they phase in and out of our dimension. That is one theory that's out there. And I actually had a friend of mine who is Native American suggest an alternate theory. She said, what if they are the ghosts of those who were here in the past? I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I've never heard a theory that a big, big boat might be a ghost. When I was really into Loch Ness Monster, um, I was thinking that was a cop out. Folks, when I, and I, was, I was saying before, if I saw a Loch Ness Monster, that'd be the end of my life. <laughs> because I would devote the rest of my life to living in a tent on the lock, trying to get that photograph. And this has happened to people who see something and no one believes them, and they are just going to prove it, and the years fly by. It's, it's a scary thing, but um, people would do this with Loch Ness. They see something in the lock, no one believes them, they live there in the lock, and after a while, they're just like, how come I can't, I don't see it again? Or every time it shows up, as soon as I get my camera, it's gone. It almost seems like there's some supernatural thing there. And they almost all go nuts with this parapsychology and all. I mean, I want I want to believe in unknown animals from a biological standpoint. I mean, I'm perfectly cool with the supernatural. I mean, that'd be fun too. But I'd much rather just find a dinosaur. <laughs> a dinosaur goes through an interdimensional dinosaur just a, a dinosaur. But for something now, but, but I go back and forth. I go back and forth. Like, when, I hate the fact that so many Bigfoot photos are tell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But then I see a lot of people take selfies that are awful. And that's pretty simple. You're standing there, you're not moving. Now, a giant eight foot gorilla jumps out in front of you. You grab your camera, you're shaking. You're know, okay, why would you take a good photo? It almost be suspicious if you took a short photo. That is true. You know? On the other hand, I get this like, oh, look at this picture. I'm like, um, what? What are you talking about? Are you talking about the big red circle? No, look in the red circle. Yeah, there was a, a dark shadow. <laughs> what is that? Oh. Here's how I can tell it's a fake. It's like, I got a photo of Bigfoot. You got a photo of Bigfoot? You took one picture of Bigfoot? Bigfoot shows up and you're like, okay, I'm going to get this composed right, okay, 180 rule, rule of threes, composed, snap. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what were you saying? We're, I'm not excited to film anymore. It's pencils. You can take 12,000 pictures on your camera. Oh, I thought maybe Elvis would show up. I didn't want to use all the battery. Like, he took a picture. If you take a picture of Bigfoot, it's because you found a tree stump that kind of looks like Bigfoot. But if you kept taking pictures of it, people would realize, hey, Bigfoot doesn't really move much, like, does it? <laughs> so that's, that's the first clue. And then there's a lot that looks like, oh, it could be Bigfoot. It could be Tom Gore in a fursuit walking into the woods. We have to have a lot of tracks. We have, and a lot of tracks. And that is an interesting thing that, you know, tra- there, there's a lot of scientific research you can do on a track. True scientists know how to take the depth of it and determine the weight of the creature. They can determine the stride of the creature. I don't have that capability or that technology. So, you know, footprints like that are. It's, it's hard to really say for sure what that might be. But years ago, when I worked for Sesame Street, I always wanted to take a pair of big bird feet and go tromping out in the woods and leave these huge three-toed tracks for some unsuspecting camper to find. So if I'm thinking it, I have to wonder if maybe other people are thinking it as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you look at these tracks, and one thing about them is they don't particularly look much like each other. No. Now, every deer track looks the same. Now, they might be bigger or smaller, depending on how big or small the deer are, but they, they all have a lot in common. This four toed, splayed out, I'm not even sure that might be lizard man. Yeah, <laughs> Ooh, that's Some are obviously fakes, but then the number of these footprints, it's just a hoax. People are really spending a lot of time on their hands, and you think, who would waste all that time, but then go on the internet and watch what people do? And lots of pictures, lots of pictures, all variations of You know, for a creature that has not been captured, has not been shot, I mean, I'm willing to buy that habit. So why are they just not out in the open here, are you taking their picture? Again, it seems a little sus- suspicious. Well, and from a scientific standpoint, there is a, um, there's something called paradelia. 
which is our brains are hardwired to pick out patterns out of chaos. We are hardwired to try to find familiar shapes and forms oh. out of chaos. And our brains actually only see about 10, or our eyes only see about 10% of what's really there. Our brains put together the rest. That's why I would this accounts for things like auto accidents or other, other big um, events differ so much from person to person because each person really does see something different. And so, you know, I have to wonder with things like Bigfoot sightings, you know, one person might see something that looks like a deer, one person might see something that looks like a fox, one person might see a tree stump. So it's interesting, you know, our, our brains kind of find in what we want to see. And I have to wonder if you're inclined, if you're out looking for Bigfoot, you're going to see something that looks like Bigfoot. And, you know, I, was, I can critique these pictures that are they're kind of useless and everything. You don't really get a sense of scale and they're too blurry to make out. But to get a good shot, you probably have to get closer. And if I'm not going to go walking up to the beautiful siren of Broad River, I'm certainly not going to go walking up to an eight-foot-tall, stinky uh, ape. Because he's got to be pretty strong. And there's a track, I guess. I mean, the tracks are going yeah, You know, we were talking about bears. I lived in upstate New York. My evidence that bears existed were exactly the same as the evidence for Bigfoot. I would come across their tracks in the snow. And that was it. Things have changed because in the last few times I've gone to upstate New York, I have literally almost walked into bears. They've lost their fear of humans and are smart enough to know what the trash comes out. So you see them there all the time. But when I was a kid, no. Traps. Occasional, someone would say they saw a bear, but no, whatever. Never found their skeletons, never found a bone or, you know. Bears don't bury their dead. Wood should be full of bear bones, but never found any. Would have been thrilled to find them. Oh, yeah. This is lizard man. Here's another one. This is probably Carolina's most famous cryptid, the lizard man, also known as the state or swamp monster. And I have a personal connection to the lizard Ooh. man that my uncle knew Sheriff Liston Truesdale, the sheriff that took the first report on the lizard man. My mom grew up down in that area, outside of Lamar, South Carolina. And the lizard man appeared, I think it was 1988, when a young 17-year-old man was driving home in his car and, and came upon this creature in the road. Seven foot tall lizard with glowing red eyes, according to the report. Now, the lizard man has been seen off and on ever since. Uh, he's described alternately as a tall lizard creature, or one looking a little more like an alligator, probably an alligator. But he is apparently well known in monster hunting circles and uh, still makes an appearance from time to time. I think the last recorded or documented sightings was in 2009. He's cool with the Bigfoot. He kind of looks like the Gorn. He looks like that thing back yes. in Earth. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. I just want to say that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that this, is, this is the only known photograph of the lizard man. Look at him there, just like. Like Ric Flair, just walking down there, and that stupid-looking tail just rang on the ground. Like, I'd say the odds of this being real are. But again, uh, there he is again in the big red circle. Yeah, see that? See that blob there? That's that's it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if I wanted anything in my life to be true. It would be this. And it's interesting, as I was saying earlier, there have been documented sightings of pterodactyls in the Charlotte area as recently as 2020. The I mean, Charlotte area. Charlotte area. And there are, there were, in fact, there was a newspaper article in Charlotte Observer, and the gentleman who saw it was a professor at NC Charlotte or a researcher at NC Charlotte, and they were talking about how there have been photographs, actual photos, I wasn't able to find any, but taken of pterodactyls over Charlotte. So that's interesting. Why would there be pterodactyls over Charlotte? Now, speculation is that, again, I mean, these are just a misidentification of big birds. But some of those turkey will just be they get pretty huge. huge. Um, but you know, when people report they saw a bird like the size of a small airplane, and people are like, well, you know, you really can't judge size and everything. Like yeah, but we've all seen birds. If, a, if you see something that makes you think it's a small airplane, I don't think that's just a ball eagle or something. You know, how big can it get? Well, this right here is a turtle. This is a bird that used to exist. They were, really could get that big. This is supposed to have died out way longer than we've been around. Um, but the Indians have the legend of the Thunderbird. 
just want to go off on the Thunderbird here because this is one of the biggest cryptozoological mysteries out there. The Thunderbird was a giant bird, came with the uh, winds, would eat buffalo and stuff, and uh, very cool and everything. And in 1890, one of them was supposed to be shot. Hung up on a barn, they took a picture, and it was printed in a newspaper or magazine. Many people have seen this photograph. Nobody can find the photograph. No one can find the photograph. So it has created a cottage industry of people photoshopping and recreating the photograph that they remember seeing. This is one of the earliest examples of what came to be known as the Mandela effect. People have absolute vivid memories of the book that disappeared, and they know the cover of the book. They know what it looks like. They can't maybe remember the name, but they were they had no doubt when they went back home they'd be able to find it in their library and find, no one has been able to find it. People who swear they had a copy, they got this place and they haven't been able to relocate it. Mandela that's a fascinating thing, by the way. You keep finding stuff out there. Someone blew my mind the other day. And like, you know the part of the Bible where it says the lion will lie down with the lion? It's like, sure, yeah, that's very popular. Lots of pictures there. It says it's not there. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, the wolf will lie down with the lion. Like, that runs your Bible. And it's like, there's nothing there about lions lying down with lions. Look it up. How? You know? Is that like that wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that wrong. So, yeah, if you see any photograph, now at this point, if you see a photograph of a, a guy standing in front of a pterodactyl or whatever, it's, it's almost certainly been photoshopped to the point where even the real thing, if it ever showed up. There's some good photos there. That's a, these are pretty good shots of Bigfoot. Um, I like to play with Photoshop, though, and there's an awful lot of cool stuff you can do. See, now, now we're at the point between deep fakes yeah. and Photoshop and... The, the CGI special effects is anything that can be said more other than an actual body sitting on a slab somewhere for a scientist that said if someone doesn't shoot Bigfoot, we are never going to believe that there's Bigfoot because everything can be fixed except an actual body. I hate that. Kill an animal to prove that it exists. Well, exactly. And in fact, I think it's um, there's one stain, I can't remember which one it is, where it's actually on the books against the law to shoot Bigfoot. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But you're right, and especially these days with technology the way it is, it's again so, so easy to fake a photograph, to fake a video, to even fake physical evidence. There was um, there have been several there was a footprint found once several footprints that were found that was said to be Bigfoot and they were huge. And they said these must be real because they were epidermal ridges in it. You know, like the ridges in your hands and palms and skin. It's like there's no way you can fake that. Yeah, there it is, and it's um, it's a, something that they do in mold making and casting, where you can take, for instance, take a cast of your foot and expand it and do a print, and the epidermal uh, ridges, they're there, epidermal the ridges. It's so all work, but yeah, it, it's, it's good, it can be done. Yeah, you know, you're talking about endangered species. That's one of the things. The wampus cat, wampus cat may just be a knot. Now we don't have knot in North Carolina, or do. We? Because we do, we obviously do, but they don't want to say that we do. Every now and then one gets run over by a car. You might say, pretty good evidence that we have them. Well, those were possibly, maybe even likely pets, because there are crazy people who keep mountain lions as pets. But there is zero doubt in my mind, there's a lot of evidence, a lot of track evidence, that there are actual wild mountain lions that have made them, we know they're in Florida, and they walk their way up. There aren't a lot of them. But they're out there, and people report that a giant cat is eating their, you know, shih tzu or something. Yeah. Um, and they're like, oh, that's just a bobcat. I'm like, there's no bobcat that big. So, but they don't want to say that because if we find mountain lions at St. Jordan Lake, we have to protect them. We've got to institute things to protect this endangered species. So the easiest thing is, oh, no, that was a swamp cat. Swamp cats are Who's they? They? You know. <laughs> now, the, folk, the folks who get into the wildlife people, I'm not saying it's a mad conspiracy of men in black or anything, but it would be a tremendous amount of work. You know, it's like when you're, when you're building a dam or something, you find out there's a snail darter that lives in this little pool, and it's the only pool that has this snail darter, and now a hundred billion dollar, hundred billion dollar dam is about to go up, you know, it's like, that's when you just like fill that little swimming pool with dirt. 
<laughs> Hope that nobody noticed. I, I am, I, okay, does anyone see anything there? <laughs> this was, I was looking for North Carolina Bigfoot photos, and this is it. I'm like, you literally just drew a red circle anywhere in this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe if it was blown up, I'd see something else. I'm like, is that supposed to be the same? Maybe area is not. This is like why you say, if you look at something long enough, yeah. you know, for some reason, I mean, we look at clouds and we're like, that looks like, you know, mom, but no one actually says, my mom was in the sky, she was huge, you know, you just accept the fact that cloud, random clouds look like, you know, Richard Nixon or something, but for some reason, we take a picture of the woods and I, I, want, oh. I want this to be true, but it's not. Yeah, no, it's not. I have kids coming in clouds. My grandmother told me that she was chased down a hill by a snake through his tail in his mouth. I don't want to tell the kid your grandma's a liar. She was just trying to. Yeah, but you know, this probably of all kinds of terrifying me the most. There's not being chased by a snake that's rolling faster than I can run. Yeah. First of all, snakes don't chase you. They're, they're hard. We'll leave them alone. You know, the kids tell oh, yeah, I had to smash this, I had to kill the snake. Why? Well, he was chasing me. But then when I get the story, it's like the kid's running after him with a stick, getting him like, Snake wasn't chasing you. I wish the snake was chasing <laughs> that, is, that is a cool idea, though. Um, All right, so yeah. I knew we were going to run out of things to talk about with North Carolina for Oh, no, you've got a few on the map there. I do, and I'll talk a little bit about those. We can talk about Nessie real quick. Sure. Uh, as we all know, okay, this is the famous surgeon's photo, taken apparently, supposedly taken by a renowned doctor. I think it was what, 1930 something? 31 or 30, Yeah, back in the day to prove the existence of Nessie. Well, it has recently been proven as a fake. Well, first of all, this is a very closely cropped, this is the original photo. And when you see the original photo, it looks a whole lot smaller. And you, when you blow it up, and it, it seems much more realistic. Now, I will say this though. They say it has been proven fake. They put a balsa wood thing on a toy, toy submarine yeah. and everything. I don't automatically accept hoax confessions as being any more true than the actual story because, again, people, why, why do people hoax in the first place? To get in the news. Why do they confess to crimes they do? To get on TV or whatever. There's at least three different groups that have claimed credit for the Patterson Big Book, which means at least two of them, 66%, are guaranteed to be false. So I don't really have any reason to think 100% aren't false. Don't know. I don't know. So, but there's a second photo too, which I didn't have. But um, there's a second photo of this that's a little odd. It's not a very good picture. This one has kind of ruined Nessie, though, know, because everyone's convinced now there's a long neck plesiosaur in uh, Loch Ness, and that I gotta say is impossible. It would have to come up for air. And is there any more photographed body of water on Earth than Loch Ness? And now we all have cameras. Every single person has a camera. Plus, it is a very, very cold lake. Very and a reptile is not going to be able to survive very long. This is one of the best pictures of Nessie that's ever been taken. And notice I said picture. Because if you'd taken a second picture, they probably would have revealed that this is what happens when you get three otters swimming after each other. It would have been a little bit more obvious than it is. And that's, you know, Loch Ness has had seals. Otters. It is connected to the ocean, so it's not inconceivable, even though, you know, an occasional small whale or dolphin might go in there. And there's, it's, it's a beautiful place. Sometimes it's almost like a mirror surface. Well, when you have like a mirror surface and something comes to the top, the reflection makes it look a lot larger. And we humans are not very good judges of size. You know, if we see a person, we can say, oh, he's somewhere between three foot and seven. Because, yeah, that's, that's like a sure. But if an elephant ran down the street, like, how tall is the elephant? Oh, then, God, he's taller than me, 20 feet? Okay, no, there's no 20 foot elephant, but, yeah, so it's, it's, it's hard. This is another one. The guy said it had a beak like a bird, and a neck, long neck like a bird, and a head sort of shaped like a bird. I think it's a picture of a bird. Um, Close up enough that, you know, if this were uncropped, because again, look at how big the waves look, and I'm thinking that's like the original one. If it was further away, it'd be like, oh, cool, whatever. I would agree. Mm. That's the other thing, Loch Ness is the waves, a deep, deep lake. And a lot of these uh, lake monsters aren't very deep lakes. Deep lakes have like their own climate. 
There could be storms going on down at the bottom that you're not even aware of, and that will create wings that will suddenly come up. Or a boat could cross, and a half an hour later, you get this wave that just appears out of nowhere, nothing in front of it, nothing behind it, rolling around. I mean, it does look like there's something solid here. But I don't know if that's just a trick of the light or, or what. Um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of this is probably just not the way it is. And again, people look for they saw something swimming under the water and you take a picture of all you see is what? You know, it doesn't go through. I, that's, that looks like someone just remade the first one. Yeah, it does. And the, you know what? This reflection doesn't work for me mm -hmm. at all. That and photo yeah, the Photoshop is an amazing thing. Yeah. And where's the second and third and fourth one? Yeah. Okay, so now here's one. Oh, yeah. Took this picture. And people are like, okay, kind of cool. One picture, one picture. And then a week later, someone went to the spot where they said they took the picture, took this picture, because this is a branch sticking out of the water. <laughs> so, okay, I mean, you can see there where, you know, yeah, it would fool you. That's actually a frame from the Dinsdale um, film. It's a 35 millimeter film of watching this dark shape, obviously very grainy and all, going through the lot. This was considered at one time one of the best pieces of evidence because it, it looks like it's submerging and coming up and all. The consensus now is it's probably a book. Just too blurry. It's too bad because I really like this. It's a good film. Yeah. And, and Denzel was one of those people after he took this photo for the rest of his life with happiness, trying to repeat that experience. He had a few more sightings but never found anything else. And by the end of his life, he was writing books about how it's probably some kind of power of psychological ghost or something. Oh, yeah. Josh Shields, local crank, lived on the lot. Never saw the Loch Ness Monster, but found it. Got a lot of photos, made a bunch of photos of Barney the Dinosaur here, sticking okay. out. Well, it's interesting to know that um, back then, I don't remember when it was, 2050, so the phone company that made a movie about Loch Ness, and when they were finished, they sank their monster to the bottom of the lake. So there is actually a fake yeah. Loch Ness Monster yeah. down the bottom of Loch Ness. Private life would show up. Yes, yeah. yes, thank you, that was it. And so there, I guess technically you could say there is a lot of this monster. This one is, is an example. This guy took this picture, uh, which I'm 100% convinced is either an otter or a seal. And he said it was 45 feet long. Well, if that were true, well, great. It's a 45 foot otter, as far as I'm concerned, it's perfect, but it doesn't have to be a pleasing sort of 45 foot otter, I'm happy. But I doubt it was 45 feet long. It was just far enough away, it seemed bigger. Otters can get big. And otters, also, I do not want to run into a big otter. They are ferocious. They are. They're predators. More dock shields. Big, 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 big. Oh, yeah. This one's interesting in that um, everything about it is pretty cool, except that this is rare for a photograph. We have something that we can use to judge the size. If you take a picture of something in the water, you can't really tell how big it is unless there's something there to judge it next to. And this one you can't. And this would be Loch Ness Monster is 90 feet long, which I think we'd be seeing a lot more. Mm -hmm. That just seems totally unrealistic. Um, it's a cool photo, though. And, and could it be a wave or what? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, they investigated this one and they found a bunch of bales of hay and some tarp. This one fascinates me. The Hugo Gray photograph. Photograph of this something splashing around in the water. It's it's sharp and yet indistinct at the same time. And when it was um, reproduced, you lose a lot of you know quality, you get a lot of pixelation. And people pointed out that it looks a lot like the dog carrying a stick. And this is the guy who said he had gone out with his dog and they saw this creature. So for a long time, people claimed that that's what it was. It's, it's a dog, double exposure of a dog carrying a stick in its mouth swimming in the water. <laughs> but that's actually also not true. Because if you find the original photograph, it's quite sharp and it doesn't have any of this dog stuff. That's from <coughs> reprinting. So another guy went back and looked at this, and what he sees, if you look right about here, 
ear, it almost looks like a mouth and an eye. He believes that the Loch Ness Monster is a giant newt, a giant salamander, based on this. And some of the some of the aspects of the creature do kind of remind one of an amphibian. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. Well, it has a pair of the shore. Um, at least once that we know yeah. of. So but it's a great example of what you're saying where we see things in it. Here's one photograph that is either a dog having a stick, a giant salamander, or, <laughs> yes. you know. This one was uh, kind of, he took this picture, and then, you know, it's so artistic uh, license here. It's the head of Nessie coming out of the water. One day, okay, kind of cool. But then, okay, so this is the photograph. Um, and if you, when you, again, when you blow things up, it increases the contrast, and you start seeing things there. And this is the actual photograph. It's a wave. <laughs> it's just a wave. And if you blow it up and you contrast it and trip around with it, it, it can kind of look like a monster head. But he didn't even think he took a picture of monsters. He just took like 11,000 photographs. I'm not sure. And then went back with them with a fine and was looking to see if any of them had a monster head. Probably by the time you got to the 7,000 pictures, like this way, right here, there's something there. Oh, yeah. This is the one that broke my heart. Yeah. This one broke my heart. Uh, some famous scientists, legit scientists, uh, were taking photographs on the water with sonar. If anything tripped the sonar, the cameras would flash. Loch Ness is the color of coffee. You can't see it. It's a great place for a monster to buy. And they got this photograph of this large thing. And I'm, we're talking like big, big thing. This would be a 60 foot monster or so. They got a few other pictures too, including one that they think might be the body with a long neck, actually way longer than it needs to be. Um, and a head. This is a worldwide news. They gave it a scientific name. A scientific American investigated it. And here's a so there's the photograph. I mean, that's undeniable. There's nothing, what else could it be but some unknown creature? There's no creature that has diamond shaped things like that. For a good reason. They don't work very well. But okay, nature works in mysterious ways, whatever. Maybe if you're going to be a giant monster, you've got to diamond shaped things. Uh, there are actually two of them, which immediately should have set off alarm bells. That these were taken several minutes apart, and the damn thing wasn't moving much. They came up with a great artist's conception of what the Loch Ness Monster would be like. It has several humps, which explains the multiple humps that we see. It's got the long gag, it's got the little gag, it's got the diamond shaped fins. People who are really into tetrapod physiology were like, I don't think this would work. <laughs> but again, platypus, you know, uh, who can hang on you? Okay, that's the actual photograph. Doesn't quite impress as much. So you're like, well, what happened? Well, they ran it through, supposedly they ran it through a computer enhancement. And the computer enhancement gave them that. And then someone did some hand waving and ended up with that. Nobody has fessed up to who it was who took a paintbrush and painted over this to get this. But that's what happened. <laughs> And so all of this was based on, we're almost certain now what this is a picture of, is a picture of the mud at the bottom of Loch Ness. It's taken in 40 foot of water, and the camera probably just swung down, took a picture of the bottom where the thing had scraped against it, and that created this line, and that line is the whole basis of the thing. So, and as for that giant head, they later found a tree stump that pretty much matched the dark royal head. Because I never thought it had been mm -hmm. one of those. No, I didn't either. We want to believe so very much. All right. How much time do we have? Five minutes. Because I want an expert opinion. Uh -huh. There's only one expert standing up there. I'm sitting down here. <laughs> so yes. here we go. Yes, we were talking about this. This the is the stabilized animal. Yeah. Patty. Okay. The famous Bigfoot patterns in film. All right. So, now, if you see the actual one, he jumps off his horse, and, and, and I'll admit, this is what I would do, he's running toward it while he's holding the camera, so it's like a blurry project, I mean, it's just all over the place. And what, now with computer enhancement, we can do things we can stabilize the photo, so we can see how it's actually walking. A couple things to know, it's a female. Mm -hmm. 
which has always been one of the things I thought was in its favor. You're going to build a big for the cost of Why did you go through the trouble of building? I'll tell you why. Okay. Because clearly, clearly, if this is a hoax, it was built by a professional, and this is exactly the kind of thing professionals do. I'll give you an example. Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Well of the Souls. Among the hieroglyphs in there are C3PO and R2D2. <laughs> in the model of the Titanic, for the movie Titanic, if you look in one of the tiny little portholes, there's a picture of Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. Filmmakers do all sorts of things to abuse themselves, and I can absolutely see some creature builders going, oh, I don't know why those moves on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> because that is exactly the kind of thing that we would do. Now, Bill and I were talking about this, and again, I'm gonna, I want to believe. One thing, people are like, well, why would, why would he go to such a link to host this thing? I'll tell you why. It's not made much, there, there's not a big fuss made out about it, but he was actually trying to film or create a Bigfoot documentary and was trying to get funding for it, and nobody would give him money. So, oh, how convenient that he just actually happens to find one. Not even really looking for it. That is, that, that is a little surprising, that two folks going out to look for it, but hit the mother road when how many people have done that since then? Yeah. Got stumped. Exactly. So some of the things here that um, indicate to me, again, as a creature builder, that this is fake. One thing a lot of, uh, uh, I forgot by the word, animal scientists have pointed out, is that when Patty looks back, she has to turn her whole body. Apparently, that is very indicative of simian behavior. Well, it is also very indicative behavior of a guy wearing a padded fur suit. If you think of football players with their helmets and their shoulder pads, when they look back to, to their teammates, they have to turn their whole upper body, not just their head, because their helmet will catch on the shoulder pad. And if you've got a big padded head on a big padded body, yeah, you're going to have to turn your whole body. Another thing that a lot of uh, anthropologists point out is that there's a ridge running down the back of Patty's line. Now, of course, a lot of simians, a lot of apes, do have that ridge, silverback gorillas, for instance. Well, it looks a bit, to me suspiciously like a zipper line. <laughs> <laughs> so again, maybe, maybe not. And then another thing they point out is you can see muscle movement under the fur. Well, one thing that many mascots have, many creature costumes have, is this under support called a pod. And this pod will often have foam muscles built onto it. So that's not surprising either. But now, in 1967, who would there be? John Chambers? Morris, the, the folks in Morris costume. Well, the, the folks in Morris costumes, they're one of the ones they who said that, that they yes. did. And they did a recreation where they made a new costume and they filmed it. It looked awful. I mean, it didn't look even remotely realistic. But I don't know if that's. To me, this looked more real than their recreation, even with the benefit of many decades of improvements. Well, and I have to wonder sometimes if that was actually part of it. Because people have often commented, well, did they have this technology back then? Well, stop and think. This was just a few years before Star Wars. Chewbacca looks pretty good. And in fact, there's a great story. I had the honor of knowing Peter Mankey through all the Star Wars stuff that I do. There's a great story where during filming of Return of the Jedi in the Bigfoot Forest, Peter Mayhew in his Chewbacca costume had to constantly have a group of crewmen around him in orange vests so that he would not be mistaken for Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that there were two men who took this picture, Patterson and Bob Peter. Yeah, yeah. They were still alive yeah. and still maintains it. And one of the possibilities is it was a hoax, but he wasn't in on it. Yeah. What if Patterson <laughs> made him promise not to shoot if they found Bigfoot, not to shoot? Which are two ways to think. You don't want to shoot an animal so rare and special. And also, if you know it's your, your buddy Tom in a big <laughs> you don't want your other buddy Bob shooting <laughs> an But boy, this thing has been, this has been analyzed more than the Zapruder film. Yeah. There are people who, you know, just repeat, looking at how, you know, saying they can see, the, like you say, the muscles rippling underneath. And, you know, that face, is, is fascinating. This is really what we think of when we think of Bigfoot. So if this turns out to be a fake, 
I know. That's one of the pillars of Bigfoot studies. We call it wind data. Having to list every single photo, every single footprint except for one could be a hoax. And if one is real, it's real. Well, and I can tell, tell you too, you were talking about the pod. Look at the back here. Yeah. You can see, look how static the butt seems. The butt muscles don't move with the rest of the legs. You're right, it does seem all the So it seems, yes. So, and here, again, zipper line, or ridge back, I don't know. It's fur, with the fur from the head, is falling Of course, now we're looking at this, this has been steady and yes. dense, and other artifacts may come into it. I, I don't know who owns the original. I, yeah, I don't know who owns the original anymore. anymore either. But again, I'm with you. I want there to be a big thing. But the more research I have done, the more I've studied this film, the less convinced.